One, two, three. Today, Thursday, June the 20th, 1974, we are interviewing from Ida Bell, Oklahoma, for the Oklahoma Christian College and the Oklahoma Historical Society. Your interviewer is James Cadigan. Today, we are interviewing Mr. Parnum B. Watson, who lives at Route 2, Oak Hill, Oklahoma. Mr. Watson, tell us what portion of this country is Oak Hill, Oklahoma, and also where you were born. Well, uh, Oak Hill is six miles west of Boken Bow, and I was born in the state of Georgia, 1881. Uh, tell us something about your early days or your early childhood in Georgia. Well, my early childhood in Georgia was uh, I left there at 10 years old. Uh, we lived on Oak Mulga River. And my schooling that I had I was one day started to school. My father took me to my grandfather at Fulvilla, Georgia to go to school with my sister. And we started to school. And I run away and went home, and I wouldn't go back to school. And that is my school in the state of Georgia. Mr. Watson, how, uh, how long did you live in uh, Georgia? I lived there until I was 10 years old. And to come down to, to Brinkley, Arkansas, to Texas County, and then on that new road at Kansas City Southern before it ever went through north and south. I helped cut right away when I was just about 11 years old with my father on the Kansas City Southern Railroad, right close to Wicks and Granite and Gillum, Arkansas. You remember, remember, Mr. Watson, about what year that was? It, uh, Mr. Watson, do you remember about what year that you come in to work on the Kansas City Southern? It was about 1900, wasn't it? About 1900. The Dirks come in, and we got to working in the timber, and we settled the country up. The Dirks Lumber Company helped settle the country up and give us all the work that we could do. Then we went to farming raising cotton and corn and cattle and everything like that till up to present time. Well now, on this form, uh, where did you, in reference here to Idabel, how far was your farm from this town? About 13 miles due north. Mr. Watson, when you left uh, Arkansas, where did you go from there? Went to Colony, Oklahoma, the in uh, Seeger Indian Training School. And there's where the five tribes was. Government had them there, sending them to school. Did and they have many students there at this school? They had 500, uh, they said 500 girls, girls there going to that school. And it was fresh. <laughs> They had all kinds of names. We, you could, I've heard them read in the history about a thunderbolt of being in that awful massacre. Of when, the, and I talked to him, and he said he was in it when they massacred some of, uh, white folks up there in that hollow. And he grabbed the. Uh, wrap a whole blanket and put on him and got away himself. Mm -hmm. And he was a full-blooded Comanche. And they had all kind of Indian uh, white women scalp there. One old creeping bear had a red-headed woman there, long hair, and he, he'd wear that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Watson, do you remember any more incidents that happened 
during this Indian uprising of Colony? Well, yes. There was Indians there raised little puppies. And there was a certain age and when they was fat, they eat them. And the way they took the hair off of them, they took and burned it off and then scraped them and they ate them then. What do you recollect uh, in the way of lawlessness that uh, went on in Arkansas and Indian Territory in those early days? Well, the part of it was pretty rough, and part of it is mighty nice, that we had some good people and we had some sorry people. Do you remember some of the names of these Indians? Yes, yeah, some of them was Two Crows, some of them uh, two, two Fades, some of them Crooked Back, some of them Little Hog, some of them Wolf Tongue, some Creeping Bear, and Big Wolf, and all kind of names, all kind of names. Big, I won't say that. Uh, I, uh, how long did you remain in this, uh, where this was going on there and at the, the girls' school? Did, uh, were you working out there at the time? I was working there. I helped butcher. I worked there four years, right at the, not in the school, but around and about the school, butchered for them. And uh, we'd have to, they'd eat their liver if you didn't roll if we didn't keep them off of it. Hmm. We'd have to get the liver and put it up, keep them eating up when we butcher the cow. Do you know if that school is in existence today? No, sir, I do not. Mr. Watson, when you left Colony, uh, what part of the country did you go to then? I went to Seymour and Abilene, Texas. And then on down to Shreesport, out to Colony, I mean uh, Cotton, and then from out of St. Louis, from St. Louis back into Arkansas on the Kansas City Southern, from Kansas City South, worked all along the road. Where, where were you married? Did you get married about this time? I got married at Wicks, Arkansas, girl Alice Lebo. She was born and raised at uh, around Wicks, Arkansas. Her, her married, and her name was Alice Lebo. And we lived together 66 years, but she's passed away now. How many children did, was born to this union? Two, two boys. Rolo and Wayne, and Wayne at uh, Idabel, Oklahoma, and uh, Rolo lives at uh, down in Texas. Now, uh, do you ha also have some grandchildren? I have two, two grandchildren. One boy, Ben Lawrence Watson, and uh, a granddaughter, Alice Watson and two great-grandchildren, uh, Blake and Kirk Watson. Uh, now, where are these children? Uh, they're the, the two boys, Blake and Kirk, at, at uh, Oak Hill, Oklahoma, and Alice is at, uh, in Texas. Oh, down there. Oak Hill, Oklahoma is where you now live, isn't it? Yes, sir. That's pretty close to your grandchildren. Yes, sir. I live right there in the mall with my grandchildren. <laughs> Mr. Watson, tell us something about your experiences in the timber. Well, the first logging I ever done was with three yoke of cattle. And I didn't have a line on them. I just had a long, about a seven-foot work. Guide them through the woods on a log wagon. It was slow work, but we... Uh, Finally got them to the mill, and they sold them up, and the people lived, and it was slow go. But them, them days when we worked cattle, people didn't think horses or mules could haul logs and that. But finally they had done away with the cattle and got the logging with mules and horses. And that was a lot easier 
and pl more pleasant to drive. Uh, during those days, did, did uh, you people build your own homes? Yes, sir. Before these logs come in, we built a model of logs. Uh, only about two room house and shedding on each side. That was about our home. How about the schools and buildings? Did you also build them? It, yes, we built them. And they had old wooden split logs for seats. That's right. Do you remember any of the one room schoolhouses during those days? Well, in Arkansas, there was Shiloh that they built. And Mount Ida they built, and Baker they built, around where I was there for several years, where my father lived. And in this country, they uh, were built Golden, they were built Glover, they were built Oak Hill. And they built since I've been to o Oak Hill. That's right. Mr. Watson, uh, tell us something about your your own brothers and sisters. Are they still living? No, they all passed away. All of my brothers and and I've got one sister left. She lives at Brinkley, Arkansas. She's the oldest, and I'm next. She's 96, and I'm 93. And they was uh, Mule, Milton, they call him. They called him, nickname called him Mule. He was a pitcher. He pitched for um, He was a professional. Yeah. He, I think he pitched uh, three or four years, I just remember. And he passed away. Mr. Watson, uh, what are you doing now since you, you've gone into semi-retirement? I'm just, just staying and enjoying myself around with my good neighbors and my grandchildren and my b two boys. What do you think of this part of Oklahoma and Arkansas? You're, you've been here a long time like to get your reaction of what you think of this part of the country. Well, I think down here in eastern Arkansas is a mighty fine country. I enjoy it, and I've been around in several states, and finally I settled in McCurtain County, Oklahoma. And I think it's the best county there are in the state of Oklahoma. Mr. Watson, uh, how old are you and uh, the, the date you were born? Well, I was uh, born in 1881, 1881, and I guess I'm you 93 years old. Congratulations. Watson, I bet you know a good story about when you were working out in Aberdeen. Yeah, the wind blowing down in that country. I was working for the fencing horse. The cattle man. He was putting a line in from a tank up to his house. And his wife cried a bit about two months. He was just making sure for my nervous and something that he did. He was malnourished in the money. He was malnourished in the money. Watson, we had a lot of trains running in those early days. Do you remember any incidents that might have happened uh, during this time, especially what took place at Worcester Junction? Yeah, yeah, I was 
Dann haben wir auch noch ein paar Nacht gehabt. Wir haben 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 noch So far, I make a little careful of myself. You're not going to pay for anything that they didn't have with my home, does it? More long as you know that. I would get my sin of my heart and shove right on it. Bearing this new back to bed. The Lord, I would see the end of it. Or over, I suspect you are. 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 Or when this is what you do. We do with Captain Roy. From Ida Bell, Oklahoma. No. On the June 20th, Thursday, 1974, we have been interviewing Mr. Parm B. Watson. Mr. Watson lives at Route 2 in Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Your interview today is James Cadigan for the Oklahoma Historical Association and the Oklahoma Christian College. Today is Thursday, June 20th, 1974. We are interviewing today Mr. Albert Mulkey. Mr. Mulkey lives seven miles southeast of Broken Bow, Oklahoma. This recording is made today from the city of Carterbell, Oklahoma, Oklahoma Christian College and the State Historical Society. Uh, Mr. Mulkey, uh, tell us where you, you were born and give us some of your background during your childhood. Well, I was born in Franklin County, Mississippi, 18 and 90. 22nd of June, uh, I mean of July. And then from I worked in sawmill there in Mississippi when I was a boy. Grew up practically in a sawmill and the timber business there with my father. And later on in years, why well, we went to Vicksburg, Mississippi, went to work in the furniture factory there. And then from there, we went up in the Delta part of Mississippi, went to making cross ties. Then we came, come from there on over in uh, Orton, down in Orton, Arkansas, down there, below Ashdown, making ties down there. Then we came on, come on up to Broken uh, uh, Hayworth, and we got a job there making cross ties out of Goodwater. We moved out there. Then I run on to that little gal. Uh, Found over there at Goodwater, you know, and flew around there a while, and after a while, I decided I'd uh, get married, and we did. And I made ties on for about five or six years, and kind of sharecropped along a little bit in this dead cock stand there. Then later, I. Uh, Moved on after a period of time. I moved over to um, in 18. In other words, I moved over to Broken Bow. Can you straighten this out when I get moved over to Broken Bow and went and I made a share crop there with Mr. Walker. Then I I made a little money that year, so I kind of picked up and bought me a team and went to farm for myself and raising cattle and hogs down there. And I bought me a little farm down there. And I raised nine children off down there in the woods. Nine children down there. I've got three out in California. One's on a visit. The other's permanent located up there have their homes. Then I've got, uh, that one went out down to visit. 
and I've got uh, six children here. That is around Broken Bow. And I have got one here in Ida Bell, Hazel Hickman. That's my daughter. And Mitchell Mulkin, Abe Mulkin, Tommy Mulkin, Irene Bray. Well, anyway, I've got nine. And I don't know what else to say. I, I, I'll tell you this. Cut it off. Tell us something about the schools you attended on your way up to Mississippi and Arkansas in your boyhood days. Well, in Mississippi, about when I first started the school, uh, I uh, went to a little shotgun house, you might say, a little long school house. Logs, made out of logs. And the benches were uh, split logs with peg legs. And, uh, of course, the split side is turned up for you set on. Fire place was built practically all the way across the end of the house. And we had to walk everywhere we went them days. Uh, school teacher, he lived seven, eight miles maybe. I don't know how far, but we had to either go horseback, footback, or in a wagon to get around those days, and there mostly trails. Wasn't many roads. So back then, it was an old ox days, and we had to haul logs with the oxen, and I've drove a many one. Haul logs back then. We said when I was a boy, after I'd got bigger, I was away from this school. Of course, I never went to school much. <laughs> but uh, the other schools I went to was pretty modern. They didn't have no electricity or nothing like that, though, back in my boy days, you know. And we just had to go along, and the water we had to carry that from the wells. Uh, didn't have no hydrants or nothing like that them days. Everything was different altogether what it is today. And but I enjoyed it, I'll tell you the truth, I really enjoyed those days. I was happy. I could eat what I had and lay down and go to sleep, get up and go to work and felt good. Now then I fill up so full and pat the old stomach pack it down so much till I misery lots of time to go to bed and have nightmares. <laughs> How about the churches in those days? Did they did you attend as many of the country churches, or were they building churches out in the country at that time? Well, uh, not very much. There wasn't much churches then. I didn't ever. Well, there was a few little churches around through the country, not many. I didn't go to too many churches. Uh, the Mormon people come in there and uh, build a little church there in our neighborhood, and we attended that some. And then they had uh, another church or another place. I think it was Baptist Church. We went to that back in my early days. And, but I enjoy going to church. Of course, I didn't get much past them when I was a kid, you know. You promise you. But we, uh, we just got a lot of things. I don't know just what to say about the situation. Oh, what do you remember? Well, are you friends with the doctor? Or during the depression? about seven miles when all this depression was on. It's pretty hard, but we made it through. I made a few ties and a little. I had a few cows and hogs. And we men, we had our chickens. We done very well. Of course, we didn't have very much, but we made up with it. And I enjoyed it anyway. You see, I had that bunch of kids around me to keep them going.
and uh, that made me happy. Give us some of your experiences yeah, on uh, shooter, but no farming you. in the, this community know, when you were well, quite be young. young. You helped a lot out in this city, man. Well, when I first counted the Oklahoma, why, bull weevil wasn't so very bad just right then, but it kept getting worse every year. And I've had my crop practically from clean. It just didn't make anything. And we didn't have any poison in them days to poison it. We just had to go on and let them eat it up. But if we made a crop, we had to haul it to market on a wagon over rough roads. And sometimes we'd have to, well, I have hauled it, uh, I guess, 20 miles to the end. And lots of places the road was sidling, we'd have to let someone stand on the other side of the wagon to keep them turned over. But we made it all right, and I've sold it as low as four cents. And, uh, it was pretty hard going, especially where you got a family. I farmed a long time in my life. I guess I've been on the farm. Uh, I stayed on the farm about 45 years straight. Raised lots of cattle and lots of hogs, but they weren't worth nothing. So lots of hogs for great big hogs, 200 pounds for $4. Uh, Cows weigh ten dollars a head. Yes, Yearlings weigh five, and six hundred pounds, three and a half, four dollars. But some things are cheap along that time too. So it's pretty hard going, but we made it. Raised nine children. Proud of them. And I am walking your own minus and rusting. Mulkey, uh, he'll never hear much of even a man. I'm not a lot of the in the log. I'll be sick. I'll do his dim, but see it. For example, I'm just a riddle with more than one. Well, down the forks, the Mountain Fork Little River down there, um, Dirks, I mean, uh, Chuck Old Lumber Company had tram roads in there. That was back in the forks. And I cut logs, me and my father did for them. Of course, they hauled them out. <coughs> mules and wagons, and, wagon. and load them on flat cars, and hauled them to Brooklyn, yes, yes, the where the mill was sitting in Brooklyn. Yeah, no. the south is kind of southeast of town. Oh, no, I mean, south of town. And they hauled them in there and dropped them in the pond, and then they washed them, and then they, them and then they, and then they and tuck them on up on the chain up to the saw and saw them into lumber. Of course, the sawdust them days were get just burned for fuel. And the Today, the now, they take the sawdust and everything, but the straw, I guess, makes flyboard out of it. Save everything. I worked there quite a while, and but I never did work on the mill at Broken Bull, but I cut logs for them a long time, made ties for them. That was for Chocolate Lumber Company, but they finally they changed their name to Dirks. And now then, it's come into the hands of Warhauser. And Mr. Warhauser, he's clearing all the land now. He's really clearing it out. Cutting everything on it. I guess we'll be living in a desert for a long time. <laughs> it's terrible. Now, I've been used to the timber all my life, and it just seems like the church in some way, you know, see that timber all vanishing like that. Of course, it has to happen to own it, you know that. So, I don't know. We're going to have to live this life the best we can. I'm proud of it, anyway. Now then, I see. I'm going to let you have it right now. <laughs> I know you are well informed on the rivers and streams in this vicinity. Tell us what you know about the rivers, and the creeks, and the sea, and the water and the broken bowls. Well, there's been a great change in the last few years in the rivers. 
Little River yeah, used to cover the bottom the pretty often, I would. but now yeah, it Calvin, hardly ever does reach out uh, like it did. And uh, Mountain Port, it's pretty well in control since they put the dam up there. We don't have no floods. Just to it had one flood, but I don't know how that happened. So it was pretty severe. About three years ago, I did. We had an overflow, and quite a few cattle got drowned in that overflow. But we haven't had an airing since. The rivers is all pretty quiet. And it seems like they're controlling the water pretty well. And uh, it's just much better than it used to be. I've seen the rivers down there, all over the bottom, seen it round up to Eagle Town, all over the, all the farmland in that country, all over. And I've had it down there, worked in the farm down there, around you've heard of the big cypress farm of you had, perhaps. I farmed that right there by the big cypress for a number of years, and I broke my land one year, and it came an overflow, that's long before the dams were there for the end. And it washed every bit of the soil off that I had broke. This was the prince of the plow point on the ground. So I just failed to grow anything that year, it just washed my land away. But the big cypress down there, I passed it every day while I was farming, that is most of the day. And watered my horse right, right at the big cypress, it just stood kind of in a little slough like. And it's a great tree. I think it measures about 10 to 11 foot through. It's quite a tree. Me and my father went down there one time to cut it for a bee tree. We had three swarms of bees in it. We took our wash tub and we took our saw and we took our axe and the wedges and the sledge and went down there to cut this tree. <laughs> and we cut out there and we began to walk around. Of course, we'd seen it many times. And he said, oh, he said, it's too big to cut. He said, that's right. Of course, I was perfectly willing to do that, you know. But it's hollow. It's nothing but a shell. Wouldn't have been nothing hard to cut. But somehow, there's, uh, something happened to it. I think lightning struck it and broke off some of the limbs. Yes. I think the river's much better now. The water control's lots better. Now, if they could just get the lover, get that for the dam, we'd have it made down below. That's our danger today, is lover. The lover's the only danger in the water we have now. If we could just get the lover dammed up, we'd be perfectly safe. It would be plum safe. You wouldn't have nothing to worry about in the water. I hope to do that someday. Well, I used to coon hot a lot down there. Back in here in the day. And it might seem funny to tell you this, but uh, they had some of the greatest big trees down there for Chalk Toll Lumber Company cut them off. There's sycamores and sweet gums and the first one and another, you know. I've seen 10 or 12 hogs run out of the holler of them old big trees, but be standing up now with their face on the side of them. It's a wonderful world back in the day and time. I was young, felt good, and everything looked pretty good. You have a good story to tell. It's a very treasure that's near it's like one of your son's farms. Tell about that. Well, back before my son bought this, of course, this land that he owns now was in timber. But uh, there was a man by the name of Silver come from uh, Mexico. He drove through in a buggy, a buggy, horse from a buggy. And he come in to around Goodwater there, and he run on to me and my father and some more neighbors around there. 
And he said he had a way built a treasure down on Mountain Forge. And he said an old Mexican woman had put in the paper, and he got a hold of the paper, and he came down there and wanted us to go with him to find it. So we went over, we all got our shovels and picks, and we pulled out over on Mountain Fork, right down in the forks of the river. My boy owns the land right, right joining where it was. And he got his um, mantle rod, uh, he began to wobble it around, and, and he finally found on that much no there, and he said, I believe this is it. Now, it was back in the timbered country. There had never been no timber cut in that country then. All the timber standing pretty as fine, you know, and everything. It was, it was beautiful. So we sat in and went to digging. And we dug there about four or five foot. Of course, we didn't find anything. Found a few charcoals down in there. I don't know what kind of them down there. This four or five foot. So we finally give up. But the way Bill read like this, some of you want to try to find it or hear of it. <laughs> it says, going west, you come to Mountain Fork. Cross Mountain Fork, the old Boat Love Ford. Going west, you come to First Running Stream. You find three mounds, and when you find them three mounds, you may know you're real close. For the girl says, my father got killed. In fact, the whole bunch got killed. Uh, after we, they'd made this raid, and they buried their money there, and they all got killed. And I was, she said she was the only one who did it. She said, I'd rather somebody get this money as they than nobody get it. So that was put in the paper. And uh, it's been on my mind a long time, but I never threw away much time of hunting it. But people around Goodwater just all went wild. There was more holes dug around that. It looked like, well, you know about how a pen cushion look, a pen's been stuck in it. They just dug holes all over that whole entire country. I don't know if it's ever found or not. But I've thought of it lots of times, but I wouldn't have no use for it. Thursday, Southwest of the where the store of Hennessy and is located. 
Drew. And Drew was was it was shortly was after the had. Oklahoma in territory it was opened and settled. Yeah, they didn't allow that. My father <coughs> drew 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 from my city law, drew and and contested a claim that had been settled by some sooner in it. And one of the contests that yeah. land was located about where that General of Western Electric Company's plant is near Mustang. But I think they only lived there for about a year. And they moved to El Rito. My father was engaged in the livestock business or trading. And <coughs> uh, later, a uh, deputy <coughs> United States Marshal. <coughs> and as a Marshal, <coughs> he was set to, <coughs> when the Cherokee Strip <coughs> was open for settlement, <coughs> he was sent to the <coughs> town site of <coughs> Eden <coughs> to maintain law <coughs> and order <coughs> until uh, <coughs> an organized <coughs> government <coughs> could be formed. <coughs> I have no rhythm, re uh, remembrance of ever living in El Reno, but my parents moved back to Cook County, Texas, before I was a year old. My uh, grandfather lived on a farm in Cook County, just across the Red River in Walnut Bend. And my grandmother had passed away. My parents moved back to live there with him. For a while, I, <coughs> coming from a, a long line of uh, ancestors who were cattle men and horse men, I was taught to ride a horse when I was four years old. I took the first horse I ever rode ran away with me. And <coughs> from then on, I, until I was practically grown, I didn't think anybody could do anything, any kind of work, unless you could do it on horseback. My people that settled in that, as my grandfather had settled in that section of Kirk County prior to the Civil War, in which he and three of his sons served in the Confederate Army. In the after the war, Jim Roth, Hanley, and Al Roth started to ranch at the south edge of the Arbuckle Mountains, about uh, the headquarters, about two miles west of the town of Springfield. They were evicted by the Indian police and the United States soldiers several different times, because that was before white men were allowed to operating in the territory, but and I later they <coughs> hired an yeah, Indian to stay at the ranch, and when the Indian police and the soldiers came around, this Once Indian claimed to be the owner, and the other boy was just working for him. But finally, the Indian government passed a law uh, granting a permit to operate in a ranch. And, uh, they continued this operation. It was some time as a partnership, but at the end of other times, each one seemed to own the stock individually. Well, they were <coughs> cattlemen, but primarily they were raised horses. And at one time, they tell me they had over 2,000 head of horses that were grazing around in the Arbuckle Mountains. They sold many horses to the oh, army, and even after I was uh, growing up, I had a sort of a mark of distinction for anybody to own a horse that had the JR brand on it, because they were some of the best in the country. Jim and Andy were all killed by the Lee boys and outlaws. S uh, south of uh, the Washington River, south of so where Sulphur is, so in May of 1885, they and 
two other men were killed in an ambush, ambush by this gang. Uncle Alvaroff then the offered a reward up. of $7,500 and a reward of $7,500 to anybody that would bring the, the, <coughs> the Lee boys in, dead or alive. And Heck Thomas, who later became famous as United States Marshal of the territory, was working as an express agent guard out of Fort Worth. He quit the job and came up to the territory to take up the chase. And in September of that year, he and Jim Taylor killed two of the Lees just across Red River near Stein's store and they collected the reward. I, <coughs> in 1899, my folks moved back to the nation as the Indian Territory was called in. We moved first to Marietta. And uh, from then, we had, we, my dad was one of these restless kind that the pastures always looked greener across the, the ridge. And so he, we moved back from Marietta to Rolf. Rolf to Colgate, to Colgate to Tishomingo. Bought a bunch of lease land. Most of it had been owned by, or was owned by a Choctaw Indian who lived out in the southeastern part of the state. But the home place was the uh, original allotment of Elizabeth Moore, who was later to be a Secretary of State and held various state offices. No place was known as the Mac Moore place. It consisted of 750 acres of cultivated land, and there were 3,000 acres of grasslands. I started to school at the Staley, Staley Ranch School before statehood. In fact, the only school, free school that I attended before statehood was uh, for a short time in Ardmore. All the other towns had uh, what they called subscription schools where the parents had to pay so much a month for tuition. But uh, I didn't attend school for one long at Ardmore. My father was away from home, and uh, my mother was keeping boarders, and <coughs> things wasn't very satisfactory in school to me, and I quit school and took to the street. About the only thing that I think I gained out of any of uh, that was that I did become acquainted with a number of uh, men who were prominent at that time, later prominent in the state of Oklahoma, and I formed a friendship with Buck Garrett, who was chief of police at at that time, and that friendship lasted as long as he lived. And <coughs> also, you had Mr. Johnson, who was a former United States attorney in the Indian Territory, who was then practicing law at Ardmore. Staley School had uh, quite a bit of trouble uh, keeping teachers, I think. I don't know, it didn't seem to me like it was a very rough bunch, but uh, the teachers were continually quitting. And in the meantime, at the time I was 12 years old, Mr. Joe Perry, who lived just west of Purcell across Walnut Creek, 
hired me. I come up and work the cattle barring times within 19. When I was 13 years old, he hired me regularly what time that I wasn't in school and paid me a man's wages and furnished me horses to ride. And that uh, occupation lasted for about until I was past 16 years of age. And I worked uh, at one summer, the last summer I uh, worked for him. I was in charge of a bunch of cattle down the valley that Papa was pasturing. And uh, the superior boy about my age, Jimmy, worked with me, but I was uh, supposed to be the foreman in charge of the cattle. And until I quit, I worked also in one winter. To, to come for Mr. Perry and the partner of his was feeding a bunch of cattle. We shipped in about 600 head of cows from South Texas, and then the, the partner was buying cattle all over Pottawatomie and part of Seminole County. My job was to get those that he bought, get them into the feedlots, and uh, on the way out, I to help around any way I could around the feedlots. But uh, in 1910, I believe it was 1910, uh, I had uh, succeeded in passing a county examination of eighth grade. And I went to Lindsay where they had a, they called it Teacher's Institute for uh, a month or so, and uh, at the end of that, I took examination and secured a third degree, third grade uh, teacher certificate. But I never I did any teaching except a few days of now and then as a substitute teacher after I started to school in Wayne. A few weeks after I started the school in Wayne, we moved into the town. And while I still kept a horse, at all times I learned that the, if I was to have any jobs, I'd have to learn to the work things outside of a horseback. But at the same time as we lived uh, just across the road from the cattle shipping pen, I got quite a bit of work uh, loading the cattle. They, uh, there was a freight train, a local freight, that was run from Purcell to Lindsay, and it usually was after night, sometime late at night. When it came back, it was a train that would spot the cars at the yard, and then when they were loaded, they bring them to Purcell, where they were hitched on to a through train, through freight then to Kansas City or St. Louis. That was before the National Stock Yards was started in Oklahoma City. It was, I was paid two dollars a car for loading the cattle, but sometimes it meant sitting over there waiting for the train most of the night. And I would occasionally get jobs, people shipping cattle in, and I'd help take them out from the pen out to their home places. But I worked at every kind of a job that was open. In fact, when I was growing up, if I uh, was out looking for work, whatever kind of a job was open, I, I was, would take it. I have worked in the broom corn harvest around Lindsay, made one peach harvest down in southwest Arkansas. And while I was down there waiting for the peach harvest to start, I heard of a didn't have any money, and I heard of a man that was going to hire a tailor. 
So I went over and applied for the job. I had uh, done a little cleaning and pressing of what clothes I had at home. And the first day, that was all I had to do around this tailor shop was to clean and press clothes. But the middle of the afternoon of the second day, the proprietor came and called me in. And there was a man, little man in there, and he had a coat on. The sleeves was about three or four inches too long for him. And when he go to wrap the coat, he'd put there and go around him twice, and he would want that coat cut out to fit him. The boss was a chalk marking it around, and I watched him, and finally he told this fellow, said, yeah, I said, we can, we'll fix that all right. I said, Charlie, I said, you can cut that down, don't you? I told him, no, I didn't think I could. The man is kind enough not to say anything to me until the customer left. He, he told him, the customer that he'd fix it for him, and when he... After he went out the door, the boss turned to me and said, I thought you hired out as a tailor. I told him I did. And uh, he wanted to know why I did it if I didn't know anything about the business. And I said, well, I needed a job. I was over there and rope and wait for peach harvest to start. He paid me off. And that was the only time that I'd ever fired from a job in my life. I finally <coughs> finished or uh, graduated from the Lane High School. My wife and I, who was Chloe Thompson, were uh, members of the first graduating class of the Wayne High School. And uh, my dad, in the meantime, had been playing politics, and he was uh, serving as sergeant of arms in the state senate. And I had been up to Oklahoma City and spent a week while they were having the first impeachment trial in the state, the trying Giles Farris, the state printer. And I stood around, and while I was up there, I got acquainted with the president of the what is called now the Northern Oklahoma Junior College. It was called the Oklahoma Preparatory School at that time. And I told this <coughs> man that uh, I w wanted to go to school up there. I didn't think I'd get in the university with what credits I had from the Wayne School, but that I didn't have any money. So he told me to come up and give me a job. I went to talk a while. Got a room in one of the school buildings there and was paid $25 a month for the janitor work, taking care of the library and the, the home economics part, or we called it then the domestic science department. I had to graduate there the next spring and then entered the university. I had uh, worked during the <coughs> summer and had saved up a little money, but long in the 1st of August, I took the typhoid fever and uh, took what money I had to pay the doctor bill. So in September, I went to Norman. I'd just gotten out of bed with typhoid fever. And the district judge, Mr. Judge Swank took me in a buggy with a little pony hitch to it on a hot day in the early part of September, and we canvassed Norman until he'd find me a job. And he finally <coughs> located me a place where I could take care of uh, four or five rooms or Mrs. Toberman is keeping some professors at of the university, and she also had two of them are boarders. My job was to take care of the room, wash the dishes. And about before the first semester was over, I got sick again. 
and was out for a month. In the meantime, that she had to get somebody else to do the work. I didn't have a job. I went back to Norman, and my mother had some distant relatives live there. The old man was 93 years old, his wife 91. They had one boy at home that was 67, and the other one was past 50. And they gave me two rooms upstairs in their house, and I went to back it. And then I worked at whatever job I could get. I, I helped dig ditch from the administration building over to the engineering building for heating pipes to be put in. And I unloaded coal out the coal yard, various jobs, and finally uh, getting toward the finish of the law school term, World War I came on, and I had uh, had in mind that I'd stay there until the graduation exercise was over and enlist in the Army. But uh, a few weeks before that, I met Roy Glasgow from Purcell, who had been up to Oklahoma City and had joined and signed up to go to the first officer's training school, and had come down to Norman on the interurban and then catching the train back to Purcell. I visited Roy there for two or three hours, and while he was waiting for the train, along about midnight when he got down there, by that time I decided that uh, I'd try to sign up and get in that officer's training school. The officers who were signing them up were to be in the, <coughs> the university the next morning. It was necessary if they'd have a couple of letters of recommendation and uh, a physical examination, or at least a statement that I'd had a physical examination before I could even talk to them. I went <coughs> back out to the university area. Got Uncle Buck Cannon, Uncle Buck recalled him, professor, got him out of bed. He wrote me one letter. I went down to Dean Monette's house, the dean of the law school, and got him out of bed. He gave me a letter of recommendation. Then I went to Dr. Gayfrey Ellison. It was getting along toward daylight then, but I got him up and he gave me what he called a physical examination and a certificate for it, and I headed back then to the administration building, thought I was going to be the first one in line. But there were four or five guys already there, sitting down the hall waiting for the thing to open up. And I got in and was accepted. The university <coughs> agreed that uh, all of us that were going to Army, especially the seniors, would be granted their degree. And then the Supreme Court held a special session and <coughs> admitted us to the bar without examination. And then on the 5th of May, I reported to Fort Roach, Arkansas, the first officer's training camp. And at the completion of it, I came back to Norman, and <coughs> in August, on the 24th of August of 1917, I married my schoolgirl sweetheart, Chloe Thompson. I served with the <coughs> machine gun battalion in the 87th Division. Was in France but a short time before the war ended. And came back to the States in the hospital in Fort Des Moines, Iowa. Finally discharged from the Army in the early part of 1919. Fort Sam Houston, Texas. 
My wife, in the meantime, had been working in the county treasurer's office in Purcell. I came back to Purcell and uh, served and acted as county superintendent for about a week or two in the absence of the county superintendent who was ill. And then I went to Ardmore where <coughs> W.B. Johnson had told me that well, if I ever got to be, uh, be a lawyer, I could have an office space in his office. But it didn't take me long down there to learn that about the only clients that ever came up to their office were some that had been the clients of Johnston and McGill for years and years. And I needed somewhere where I could start out and be able to make money, make a living for myself and wife. So I left Ardmore and went to Punk City and applied for a job with a young then growing Marlin Oil Company. Mr. Lucas, who was Mr. Marlin's private secretary, was a personnel director. And he assured me that I could have a position in the legal department, but that Mr. Marlin had to personally okay all the hiring. And that as he was in New York, it'd be about 10 days for.